Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Costa Cianias. I'm the area manager for the Orangeburg office. I'm also a business consultant with the Small Business, South Carolina Small Business Development Centers. And here at the SPDC, we're a network of professional business consultants that's dedicated to the small business sector. It's made, in par uh, and it's made possible through the Small Business Administration as well as the state of South Carolina and our higher education hosts, which are University of South Carolina, Clemson University, Winthrop University, and in South Carolina State University. And we're here to provide consultations for your business. We also educate, and then we also have referrals. We, we're, we have resources that we're able to refer you to and get you connected with, with services that we may not provide or take you to that level of service that is above what we would do for instance, uh, legal services or, or accounting or, or even banking. Uh, our value proposition is the SBDCs are designed to mitigate small business failure and to assist entrepreneurs by validating concepts and business and providing valuable business insight and finding capital, growing or expanding your business, securing government contracts and technology com commercialization, as well as many other uh, areas. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Doug Limeberry, who's going to present for us. Excellent. Thank you, Costas. Um, everybody, today is an interactive session, meaning I want questions. If anything I say is confusing or if you want further elucidation on it, please ask. Um, I think the best way, uh, the only way really is to learn is ask a question. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask. So trust me on this. Um, I will try. Um, it's hard for me to see the chat with PowerPoint blown up in front of me. So if uh, Costas or Sarah or Emily or somebody would let me know if we have questions on chat, that would be awesome. Um, guys, my name is Doug Lineberry. I'm an intellectual property attorney. I've worked with the SBDC for a long time. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on their state board. I love the SBDC. They're a great organization. Uh, they're good for business. They help our small businesses in South Carolina expand. They help us get bigger. They help our economy. Using them is a very smart thing. Now, today, though, we're going to talk about the lost art of negotiation. And you might be like, hey, I know how to negotiate. You got to stop back and ask yourself, do you really? Because part of the issue is, you know, when we have a negotiation, people tend to too often uh, view it as maybe necessarily antagonistic. Maybe it's, you know, take it or leave it, those sort of situations. And what I want us to understand is that it's not. There's almost always something that we can do to allow someone to have power, freedom, et cetera, in a negotiation. So today I want us to have some key takeaways. You know, what are some tactics that help us successfully negotiate? You know, what are some strategies to negotiate? You know, how do we do it from a position of strength? You know, how do we make deals that are good for our business? You know, what to negotiate? Some things may be locked in stone, some are not. Figure out which is which, and then you'll know what you can actually negotiate on. What do you do after the negotiation? Because a lot of times, you know, if you get keyed up, if, if you're looking for a supplier or if you're looking for a vendor or somebody, you know, you probably immediately focus on, okay, I got to get a deal. I got to get a deal. Well, remember, too, that that deal is the beginning of a marriage. After that, what we've got to do is to focus on, hey, did we enter into a good marriage? Do we have the terms of the marriage very clear so everybody understands what our responsibilities are? If we don't do that, we're going to have some problems. So what I want us to do is um, foremost start off with Abe Lincoln. If you're going to go into a negotiation, remember that you prep for it before you sit down at the table. You know, you just don't walk in and do it, you know, fly by night, let me Johnny Six Gun this. Do not do that. You know, Abe says, hey, give me six hours to chop down a tree. I'm going to sharpen an axe for before that. So and it all begins before that. Understand the other side. Understand who you're dealing with. Understand you. Because there may be things that your business is like, hey, you know, I'm absolutely um, good at negotiating on this point, but I absolutely do not want to negotiate on some other point. And that's okay. Because when you realize that, hey, you know, I've got the ability to negotiate. I've got the ability to change some terms. I've got the ability to make things better for me. It increases the way you think about these negotiations. And so guess what? Let's look at a supplier agreement. You know, you're starting out as a business. You're thinking, hey, you know, what do I do? How do I get a better deal? What can I find out? And again, like Abe Lincoln said, start before you're at the table. You know, what's your spend? You know, how valuable are you to this vendor? You know, if you're an 800-pound gorilla 
and you know it, then guess what? You have a lot of ability. Now, if you're a smaller business, guess what? You're more nimble. You've got the ability to negotiate better. You're not locked into some sort of bureaucracy like the 800-pound gorilla is. So you've got a lot of ways that can help you that you probably don't think of right out of the gate. You know, what's your spend? You know, how fast do you pay? A lot of things like that. The big guys sometimes, and even the law firms, are like, hey, if we use your services, you're going to give us a discount. If we use your services, we get to pay once a quarter. If we, if you use our, uh, if we use your services, you know, we're going to dictate a lot of terms. Well, as a smaller company, you may be able to get better terms by saying, hey, i like to pay back within 10 days. Can you give me a discount on that? I want you guys to get brazen about asking for things. I don't want you to be afraid. There's nothing embarrassing about negotiation. It's embarrassing if you don't, you leave money on the table. Um, you know, Sarah was telling me uh, before our call started today, she's down at the Coger Center getting tickets for Hamilton. And one thing she did was she paid in cash. And guess what? Saved her money. Because the Coger Center says, hey, I've got to hit you with credit card processing fee. There's an electronic processing fee, yada, yada, yada. Sarah thought out of the box and said, you know what? I'm going to pay cash. Ended up saving money on that. A lot of money. I'm not talking 75 cents. I'm talking decent, good money. And that's what we want you to think for your business. Are there ways that in this good old electronic age of AI and cybersecurity and everything else, are there some simple basic mechanisms that I might be overlooking? Like, hey, I'll pay you by X. I'll pay in cash. There are a lot of ways, guys, that you can have a good relationship with somebody and you don't have to be BMW. You don't have to be Michelin. Uh, you know, guess what? Understand yourself. That's how you get this value. What have you purchased in the past? What are your patterns going to be? Uh, what's your forecasted volume? If you think you're going to have a huge increase, prepare your vendor for that because they may, they, they're awesome about that. And they're like, hey, we want to help you with this. But really what we have to do is to make certain they can't. You know, you don't want to surprise them and enter into a deal and be like, hey, guess what? I know we've got this deal, but now I need you to a thousand X, whatever we agreed to originally. Make certain that you do that. Also, look at your terms with your current suppliers and vendors. You know, is there something in there you like? Is there something in there you don't like? You can use those as a template when you negotiate with the new vendor. Um, also, if you have contracts from uh, the previous vendor, you know, maybe you're talking to somebody you've been working with for years, guess what? It's okay. I ask clients how I do all the time. If I goof something up, tell me. I want to fix it. You know, I want you as the client to be happy. The vendor wants you as the client to be happy. And so if you've kept a track record, you've looked at their documents, you know, things that are good or bad, you can use that in your negotiation. So y'all, I realize I talk very fast. I'm going to stop real quick and see if anybody has a question at this point. And everyone should be able to unmute themselves if, or raise the hand if they have a question. Absolutely, you guys. Feel free to do it. Now, y'all, now look at this simple uh, negotiation we've got going here. You know, we're sitting here at a, a game of Texas Hold'em. You know, we've got the flop down. Everybody's looking at it. Uh, if you're the ace king guy or the ace queen guy or gal, you're thinking, man, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Look at me. And if you're the ace queen person and you see that other queen out there, you're like, hey, I got a good shot at this. And the ace king person's like, okay, I'm looking pretty strong. Pair of kings. And that pair of sevens is thinking, all right, got a pair of sevens. What do I do? And y'all, poker is a negotiation. And you're like, I'm not. <clears throat> and y'all, pardon me, I'm getting over a head cold. I'm still a little funky. But poker is like any other negotiation. you got to understand your strengths, and you have to try to anticipate the strengths of others. Now, pocket sevens, that's pretty good. You know, you started out, you got a pair that's looking real strong. But right now, that ace king holds all the cards at the moment. You know, we're sitting here, we're still waiting on the two more. You know, we've got the river, we need, uh, we've got the flop, we need the river. You know, where are we on this? What's going to come up in the future? That's what we have to figure out. But like Kenny Rogers said, if y'all aren't country uh, fans, listen to this song because it is a great song about negotiation. I'm not a big country fan, but if you hear this, it is awesome because it sort of tells you the entire environment of a negotiation. You know, when to keep things close to your chest, when to give up. It is okay to say, hey, this deal's not working and walk away. That's perfectly fine. And how fast you extricate yourself from a deal is a great one too. So I would like y'all to always consider that. I am about subcontract. Cool. Uh, Michael Bailey's got a question. He says, any advice about dealing with universities about subcontracted research proposal costs? Michael, it's this situation, my friend. You know, what can you supply them? What can you do differently from the others? What can you do better than they do? Now, understand, too, that universities are going to be a state-funded group, so they do have a lot of bureaucracy to go through. So what you will want to do with them is reach out to other vendors, 
you know, find out some people who are currently working with them. You know, what are their pricing or the limitations on this? Um, you know, what can you do to make them easy? I, I do patent work for USC and they have a very set price guide. You know, they have a very uh, patterned out way that they do this. And so what you want to do, Michael, is to ask around some others you've dealt with. And if you've done it before, go back and look at your agreements. What you like, what you not like, and ask, you know, say, like, hey, what can we discuss? What can we haggle on? Oops, sorry, y'all. I've got a roller uh, ball here. So if I get too far down, that's the problem. So for us guys, we have to ask, you know, what do you want to gain? You know, Michael, you're like, hey, I want to do business with the university. You know, I want to get, a, I want to be one of their selected vendors. I want my research to work out. I want this to be a good thing. Uh, yep, Michael, USC is who I'm dealing with. Awesome. And so what you want to do is to find some other folks who have done uh, research proposals for them. You know, reach out to the industry, reach out and see other people who have done it. Find out what they've done, because the more you know, you know, each situation is unique and it depends on the research and the scale of it. But there's certain things that are automatically just going to be sort of set in stone or certain things that are going to be negotiable. So reach out to the other vendors who dealt with USC. You will find that you will learn a lot, even if their research is entirely different from yours. Now, one thing to do is, you know, again, Abe said, prepare before negotiate. What do we want out of it? You know, guess what? Michael wants to work with the university, wants his research to be funded. You know, what do you want to compromise? You know, how big is your lab? How many assistants do you have? You know, what do you refuse to accept? You know, the university says, hey, guess what? We have 95% of whatever you come up with. Nope, can't do that. No goes. And again, think back to the sage Kenny Rogers. No one to hold them. No one to fold them. No one to walk away. No one to run. It is okay to say no in a negotiation. Um, what, what's the other side going to say? You know, you roll in and you're like, hey, I want X, I want Y anticipate what their thoughts may be. You know, is it expensive? Is there a time delay? You know, kind of think of it from their uh, thoughts and it gives you the ability to have a better negotiation principle. Um, consider the outcomes. You know, that's one thing we should do all day. You know, think of it as your shower thoughts. I'm going to go in, I'm going to talk to this person. You know, if Michael's going in, it's like, hey, you know, I want USC to fund my research. You know, how do I haggle with them? You know, what am I willing to give points on? What do I just absolutely have to have to do good research? Know those. If you know those going in, it's going to help determine those goals and have a range, guys. I know it is so easy to be like, I need fifteen thousand dollars. I need it. Got to have it. Could you get by with eleven? Could you get by with you know? And say, hey, a thing, a common tactic I always said is, you know, ask for ten to get five. If you know your number's fifteen and you go in at fifteen, you think, man, I'm being very reasonable. My gosh, I'm the most reasonable person they've ever met. Y'all, that's the anchor number. We'll talk about that here in a second. But here's the problem with it. You know, you've now said, hey, 15, but guess what? 15 might have been your minimum number. That is not a good way to start your negotiation because if I'm on the other side, if I'm USC talking to Michael and he says, I need 15K from research, well, in the back of their mind, they're like, okay, this is his intro number. This is him trying to set an anchor. And so they're going to view that as negotiable. And what I need y'all to realize is you have to be somewhat savvy about this. Think in ranges. Think an opportunity. Do not think in finite specific points. Now, y'all, if you've never met a honey badger, I encourage y'all to find YouTube videos. That He's the little guy over here on the right. Kind of looks like a souped up skunk. And uh, these little jokers are inherently just one of the most evil, vile creatures on the planet. They're hilarious because they're one of the most evil, vile creatures on the planet. But I don't want you guys to negotiate like a honey badger. You know, right there, you've got a honey badger approaching the line. And that thing, you've heard the slogan before, honey badger don't care. You guys do care. You guys want to negotiate. That's why we're going to plan before we go in. And guess what? Being nice is not weak. Uh, the guy in Will Smith fans in here, he had a rap song about this back in like 2006, 2007, uh, Nice Guy. And I'm telling you guys, being a nice guy is not a problem. You know, I think you see Hollywood, you see all these things, and it's like, here's how you negotiate. You go in, you slam a shoe on the table, and you'd be very, very powerful. That doesn't do you a lot of good, guys. You will always get more flies with honey, period. You know, vinegar is awesome on fish and chips. Ain't so good on a business deal. So what I want y'all to realize is we have to be a negotiator. We have to be cordial. The honey badger only works because, guess what? He's a wild animal. He doesn't have a business he's trying to run. He is basically just an automatic, frenzied machine, and that's how he is. I don't want y'all to be that way. What I want y'all to do is instead watch who you're dealing with. You know, watch the nonverbal cues. Watch their body language. You know, what's their eye contact? If they're not making eye contact with you. There's some reasons for that. Some people are naturally shy. They may be avoiding a subject. Uh, they might be uncomfortable about something. You know, notice, are they nodding when you talk? Sign of affirmation. Do they lean in? Like, hey, this is interesting. Tell me more. 
Do they lean back like, wait, wait, you know, maybe I'm getting a little defensive. Do they cross their arms? You know, be on the lookout for this, guys. It's not just to go in there, present your message, and run out. That's honey badger. We're not honey badger. We're an observer. We're kind of like the lady watching the honey badger. We're like the person in the blonde on the savannah. And we're watching this little crazy guy climb up a tree and fight a cobra. Because that's what a honey badger does. But we have to pay attention to that situation. If we just go in to tell them what we're going to do, we're not listening. And if we don't listen, we don't hear what they say. And, you know, I'm a talker. I get it. One of the hardest things I have to do is shut up and listen. And everybody loves to talk, man. We're a verbal communicative species. It's how we communicate. It's what we do. But in a negotiation, turning it off is a smart thing. You know, what are they saying? What are they not saying? You know, what are terms they keep bringing up? You know, what are things they don't talk about? Those are key points you can use in your negotiation. And God forbid you ask for feedback. If you're sitting there in a negotiation, it's entirely okay to break the fourth wall and say, hey, you know, I think we're having a good talk here. You know, how do you think this is going? Ask them. You know, it's okay to do that. Um, it's even better to have a backup. Because as y'all know, you've heard the old military adage, you know, no, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. As soon as that negotiation starts, things are going to shift. They're going to change. You may have come in and anticipated A was going to be their concern. It might now be B. And so what you got to do is to figure out, hey, how do I work this? And I want y'all to remember this last powerful. I want you to haggle. I want you to horse trade. I want you to bargain. I want you to cajole. Sweet talking and shining on is a beautiful thing because what you need to do is establish a rapport, figure out who you're dealing with and how do we help them help your business. Now, the little souped up skunk over here, I don't want y'all being that guy. This is what we call a visual cue. I don't want anybody being a honey badger. Now, at this point, I am going to stop and see if anybody has any questions at the moment. Feel free to unmute. Feel free to send a chat, whatever's good for y'all. I have a question. Okay, absolutely. Go ahead, T. Price. I am really bad at giving away the kitchen sink. Oh, my dear. Let's talk. Okay, so why extreme, is that, T? What, what is it that makes you think you have to give everything away? I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but I always come out feeling like I have not, I have not um, um, supported myself. Okay. Understand. And so I need to get past, I think it's part, I don't know what the problem is. I really feel like this. I have a problem asking somebody else for money. Okay. Hey, T, that's okay. We are a proud people. We're Americans. You know, we're a proud people. And, and, and I hear you. It is kind of weird to be haggling with somebody. So T, here's what we're going to do. What this is, is business. You know, this isn't personal. And T, what's your first name? I can call you T Price if you want, but I'll call you first name if you wish. Delancey. Delancey? Mm-hmm. All right. Delancey, I love this question. It's the first time I've been asked this one. But what you got to do is look at these skills. And you go in there and you think in ranges, Delancey. That's going to keep you from giving too much away. You got to think, what is my absolute minimum? What is my maximum? And I want Delancey to start thinking, hey, it's okay to ask for that maximum. Actually, it's a very good thing because to answer, you strike me as the person who will roll in and you're like, hey, I'm going to be very reasonable. I'm going to hit you with my base number. And then that way, we're going to short circuit all this. We're going to make it so that, you know, I'm being cool. Here we are. But remember, to Lancy, we're all proud Americans. And what's going to happen is the other side's going to think that at initial offer that you're like, hey, I'm just trying to be real. I'm just trying to get this out. Now, Sharon Price brings up a really good idea. She says, believe in your product. To Lancy, I want you to believe in you. Because what I, and I know that sounds very touchy feely and you're like, man, this is a little weird, but a lot of negotiation is your own mental mindset. And Sharon, I, I love that. That is a beautiful thought is you got to believe in what you're doing. And to Lancy, what I want you to believe is it is okay to talk to these folks. It is okay to make commerce go round because you know what? I talk to people about pricing all the time. And Costas is dead on. You know, T, what I want to tell you to Lancy is don't be afraid to lose the deal. Kenny Rogers said it all. You got to be willing to walk away. Think of being on a car lot. Those guys are some of the best negotiators on the planet. That guy comes out, he's wearing that brown suit. He's got his hair all slicked back and greased. You know, it's 98 degrees. This guy's not sweating. And you don't notice that. You're like, all right, I'm here for a car. But what that all is, to Lancey, is a negotiation. Man, would you go in and take the sticker price? You would not. You go in to haggle. And to Lancey, I'm telling you the opposite for you. If you need X, we're going to start you at asking for X plus five, X plus 10, X plus 20. Maybe that's a percentage. Maybe it's a number, whatever it is. But you're not doing anything wrong by negotiating. Indeed, we call it the lost start to Lancey because to Americans, it feels a little weird. 
You know, we're like, we're used to going to Walmart and you pay a price. We're used to going to Publix and you pay a price. But I'll tell you this, in business, you know, those prices are negotiable. You can negotiate term, you can negotiate cost, you can do, negotiate delivery dates. There's a lot of things we can work on for Lansing. If the price makes you uncomfortable, be willing to give on something else and say, hey, you know what? Here's my range. And if you're going to start a number, you do not start with your lowest number, guys. I know you think you're being reasonable. You're not. What you're actually doing is you're locking yourself into a point to where you can't negotiate away from it. So, to Lancey, does that help? Yes, it does help. I think part of the problem for me is that I've always worked in corporate mm -hmm. and I'm just moving to this. So what I used to do yeah. when I was corporate, I was being compensated in corporate. Yep. And so I could give the service away with no problem. But now that I'm starting to move over to my own business, yep. I need to make that leap because I'm not getting that money in corporate. Palanza, you and I have the exact same issue, believe it or not. Now, granted, you were smarter than me and did not go to law school, so your stress level is a lot lower. You probably don't have 14-year-old twins. I mean, I'm 19 years old. Look at all the stress I've got going on. <laughs> but what I'll tell you this, Talance, is I have that exact same thing. When I was a baby attorney, I hated giving people prices. Hated it. I still don't like it, but you know what? I do it. And I'm willing to negotiate with people, man. It's like if you come in and say, hey, you know, I need an extra why, I do negotiate, Talance. And I'm with you because you're like, hey... I don't want to be a pain in somebody's butt. But to Lancey, like you said, you're now changing your skin. You are going from the corporate world to the to Lancey small business world. And mm -hmm. I need you to understand that it is okay to take care of yourself. And I know this sounds like hooroo guru, but it really is negotiation. This is what we do. And it's okay to have a price. And it's okay to say, I'm not falling below this. You know, Sharon said, believe in your product. Costa said, don't be afraid to walk away. All of those points are right there with it. And now you're most welcome. I saw your thank you pop up. Flancy, but y'all ask questions. I love this because notice Flancy brought up a question. I bet a lot of y'all are thinking, you know, it's like, hey, gosh, you know, how do I do this? You sit down, you do some research first, um, you go into the room, practice. If y'all got kids, brothers, sisters, find somebody at the library, whatever works, practice. If you want to get better at negotiation, practice. You know, y'all, I've been an attorney now. I'll still age myself here. I've been an attorney. Man, y'all making me do math. That's kind of hard. 26 years. And I'll tell you, I am better now at negotiation than I ever was out of law school. Part of it's real world experience. Part of it, I love Sharon's like, I love negotiation. And Sharon, there's some people who love it and there's people who hate it. But I want y'all to at least be comfortable with the concept. I want y'all to understand that it's okay. It's okay to be glancing and be like, hey, you know, the price of my heart I'm thinking I'm worth is X, but I'm going to ask for X plus 22% because by gosh, I want to range. I want some negotiation room. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, want versus need. The main thing we want to figure out is what do you need? What do you want? Uh, Michael Bailey has chimed in. He says, I own two car dealerships in North Charleston, Somerville. The biggest mistake people make is basing decisions on emotion, not logic or reality. Michael, thank you. That is beautiful, guys, because what we really want to do, if there are any Star Trek fans in here, I need y'all to kind of be Dr. Spock. You'll notice I told you, don't be the honey badger. I need you to be Dr. Spock. I need you to be very analytical. And just like Michael said, if you get emotional about it and you need it, you need it, and you want it, well, you need to separate those two. And you need to figure out what do I want and what do I really need? Because the need is what makes your business work. The need is what you have to get out of the deal. The want is the emotion. The want is the, wow, I'm going to be a great negotiator. I'm going to bang my shoe on the table. Separate those two, y'all. And Michael, that's a really good point, man. Emotion is the enemy of logic. That's why I tell y'all to practice. You know, you practice it, you practice it, you practice it, and you aren't so flustered. You don't feel your neck getting red when you talk. You know, you don't feel kind of disjointed by the situation. And the emotion is slowly pulled out of the situation. Uh, rapport building off. You know, it's so funny. Uh, people think of attorneys as all being like hostile. I have found over the years that if you will treat a fellow attorney just like a person and ask how their day goes, even if your clients may not get along, it makes things easier. Now, I've got some that you don't jive with, and it's just going to be a difficult situation, but we don't need to start a negotiation hostily. We don't honey badger. I mean, Mr. Spock, we're emotionless, and we're thinking. We're not in there like a crazy little honey badger getting ready to find a line because it's Tuesday. What we're going to do is we're going to have us a plan. We're going to have a backup plan. You know, if they tell us no, like if Delancey says, hey, my number's 86. She knows her real number is 60. Guess what? She's got a little room. She can compromise. They can come back and say, oh, I can't do 86. I can do 69. 
she can come back and say, well, guess what? I can do eight. And you just start the dance. And you start seeing to where you end up between. But if you start out of the gate with that low number, if you're like 60 is a number, got to have 60. Well, they're going to come back with 40. And guess what? They're going to expect you to back off of it. So I do need all of y'all to understand, ask for 10 to get five. Ask for 10 to get five. Start out with that. Um, you know, your time restrictions, guess what? How long do we want this deal to last? How long do we wait on delivery? Um, guess what? Hit them with multiple offers. You can say delivery for X price this day, delivery for Y price that day. You know, you've got a lot of ways to phrase this. And you've also got ways to where you can figure out what works with them. You can horse trade. You can haggle. You can talk. Um, confidence, guys. Confidence, confidence, confidence. If you go in there scared, if you go in there afraid, they're going to see it. You know, you're probably dealing with somebody who's negotiated before. I want y'all to practice some. I want y'all to go find somebody from church, talk to them, say, hey, sounds a little weird, but I need you to listen to me do this. Now, I want to tell y'all, back to Michael, this is not an emotional thing. It is not an emotional thing. It is not an emotional thing. I know you're like, man, you just repeated that three times. It did. I'm going to say it again. It is not an emotional thing. It is business. This no is not a reflection on Costas. It's not a reflection on Sarah. It's not a reflection on Doug. It is just business. And that's how we keep it. And it will enable your mind to be nimble. And that's also why you practice. Because guess what? You know, you practice, you practice, you practice. It takes the emotion out of it. And uh, Clancy, that's one of the bravest questions I've ever heard asked, to be honest. Because you know what? You're like, hey, I know what my weakness is. I don't like asking people for money. And I am tempted just to start out on a low ball number just to make this go away. I love it. You have done one of the things that is so hard for somebody to do. You have looked at yourself and said, hey, I know I got this issue. And by our grannies, I want to know a way to fix that issue. And I'm telling you one way to do that, too, is to come up with a range. You know, don't go in there at that bottom number. You figure out what your range is. You know what you And remember, want versus need, emotion with want, logic with need. Figure out what you need, and then you can ask for what you want. And then somewhere in the middle, we approach that little happy medium. Oh, sorry, y'all flipped it too much. Listening again, guys, the one reason I hit on that, I realize I'm sitting there talking, 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 and not listening to y'all, but we really do want to listen to folks. You know, I love Hemingway. The Old Man to See is a great book. And when you read it, you're like, man, this is a sad story. But at the end of the day, the old man didn't matter that he did not bring that fish back. What mattered was the village saw that he was still capable of landing that big fish. He was still capable of negotiating the ocean. He was still able to go out there. And I want y'all to understand you know, Hemingway said, look, if you're sitting there talking, you got to listen. And a negotiation is exactly that. I want you to be a listener. What are they saying? What are they not saying? If you think you heard them say X, and this is called active listening, you can say, hey, well, you know, you just said our delivery date could be uh, February the 13th. Um, you know, what about this price for that day? And then you've told them, hey, I'm listening. I heard that you want a delivery date here. But ask open-ended questions, guys. One thing you want to do in a negotiation is just like a good cross-exam. You ask open questions. What, how, please explain. If you'll do that, you get them talking. And it's perfect to get them talking because the more they talk, the more you listen. And what we want to do with that, I'm so sorry, guys, I flipped the switch. Um, but what we want to do with that is we want y'all to understand it's okay to have a little dead space. Indeed, it's a good thing. Now, y'all, we talked about anchoring bias just a little bit before. And to Lancy, one thing I want us to understand is when you throw out that first number, realize that this is the first number mentioned in that negotiation. You know, if you threw it out, it's got a little power on it. It's kind of like knowing the name of a dragon. You know, you've got the ability to be like, hey, dragon, I know your name. I got a little control over you. So what we want you to do is realize when you throw that number out, that number tries to act as an anchor. But you want it in your favor. If the other side throws out a number, then you need to throw out your anchor and you need to establish that number. You know, that's why we have that range. You know, what do I need with my logic? What do I want with my emotion? You use those two to help you figure out the range of your number. Um, making a first offer is a good thing. It puts you out there, but you ask for the want. Remember, ask for 10 to get five. And so what we want to do is we keep these goals in our mind, y'all, because, man, I am so sorry, guys. I was trying to go over to click on the names of everybody. And this little sensitive will will just flee on me. And it's awesome. But what I want us to do is to realize with this anchoring bias, we have to have our ranges in order. We want to know what we're going to talk about before we get there. And so for that to happen, let's figure out who we're negotiating with. 
you know, what are these people like? You know, here's the bluster. Here's the honey badger. This is the guy who's like, here's how it's going to be. You're going to do this. We're a vendor. We're a huge vendor. You're going to work with us. They don't listen. You know, they really don't. And so what you need to do is facts. Facts are the way that you uh, disarm this time bomb. You know, stick to the content of the deal. Slow the roll. Break that tempo. They won't be going to tirade. They're going to tell you how it's going to be. Hey, man, how was your weekend? You know, hey, you know, now that you mentioned that, did you see that game the other night? Slow the tempo. Change how they work. Um, take breaks. It's okay to go get a glass of water. It's okay to go to the bathroom. Don't care if you don't have to go. Go go in there, wash your face, stare in the mirror, point at yourself. I'm like, I'm not a honey badger. I'm Mr. Spot. Get this fixed. Um, calm. Guys, Michael, that was beautiful. Emotion is the enemy of logic. I want y'all to understand that a negotiation is kind of like a play. It's not something you do just spontaneously on the street. There have been dress rehearsals. There have been practices. There's been a lot of stuff involved before you sit down with that other party. Um, and so what we want to do is I want to tell y'all that we're really sitting here looking at being calm. We're really looking at trying not to be emotional. We want to focus on the substance with the bluster. Now, a cool little technique with them. If y'all have ever read Sun Tzu, make them think you're strong where you're weak and weak where you're strong. You let this bluster believe he's won. Like, man, this was a great negotiation. Awesome work. Man, this was really good. I feel like I learned a lot from this, et cetera, et cetera. Great thing. And that's really what I want y'all to do is to understand their different mindsets. And nobody's completely locked in one. Like we got the negative Nancy. The negative Nancy is like, oh, problems, problems, problems. You know, no positive, always problems. We call them a seagull around here. They fly in your office, they poop everywhere, and they head out, and they left no solutions but a mess. And so what you guys have to do is realize they're risk adverse, and they love giving horrible examples. Oh, if we do A, the Titanic will go down. What you have to do is to counsel that when you come back and say, hey, look, we're going to give realistic examples. You know, we're going to have delivery dates. Uh, we're going to have static deadlines here. We're going to have things in order. So you help to undo their emotion. Because remember, we're not emotional. Like Michael said, keep the emotion out of it. We don't want emotion. Now we got the bureaucrat. Bureaucrats are all form over substance. My form. It's always been done this way. This is how we do it. So what you need to do is stick to your issues. To know those issues, you got to practice. You know, Delancey knows her range now. She knows what she needs, the logic. She knows what she wants, the emotion. That's how she's going to make her range for the numbers. She's going to anchor it by asking for the want, the illogical emotional, and knowing that I've got this in my back pocket, and I can always haggle between the two. Um, again, stick to those issues with the uh, bureaucrat. You know, Don't let them get you, hey, here's the form, here's the form. It's like, look, we're trying to do this deal. We want to accomplish this. I uh, do show respect for the process. If you show disdain for the contracts, if you show disdain for the bureaucracy, a bureaucrat will instantly buck up. And so what you need to do is be sympathetic. It's like, hey, man, I understand. You know, I get this. Now, our nuclear option here is if your bureaucrat's a pure bureaucrat, you're dealing with somebody who has worked at the DMV for a thousand years and they're not budging and they're not going to do anything different than the way it's been done, you ask for the manager. You go full Karen on it. Karen's kind of like a honey badger. But, man, I'm saying it's okay to do it in this situation. And I'm not saying I do it two minutes into talking to a bureaucrat. But if you're dealing with a bureaucrat and you're like, I am not getting anywhere here, then what you need to do is say, hey, Tom, is there any way that I can talk to your manager? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm loving what we have here. But I think what we need to do is to bring in more bureaucracy. We need to bring in more bureaucracy. We need to bring in people who further understand the underpinnings of this. I want to talk to them about this. Let's get them involved. And you don't do it in the way of, hey, bonehead, you suck and I'm leaving. That's not what we're going to do. You do it in the way of, hey, I'm working within your bureaucracy. I know you're here, and I bet you if we enlist this person, we might be able to make things different. And so if you use that with them, you sort of use their own bureaucracy against them, that'll be an awesome thing. Now, the diplomat, uh, watch these guys. They're like the politicians. You know, when the voting year is up, they're always in your neighborhood telling you what they're going to do for you. But three years after voting, you never see them again, and those promises are still out there flailing in the wind. Um, but the, what they will do is they'll focus on the market. Well, I need you to know the market, too. I need you to look at those past vendor deals. You know, in the case of, like, Michael, I need you to have spoken to somebody and said, hey, how, how did you work with USC? How did that work? What was going on? Tell me about your terms. Um, again, watch the diplomat. They are not bound by facts. They like to be like, hey, you know, polar bears are vegetarian. You know, we talked about that a little earlier. It's a way you can trick AI is by giving them a lot of fresh, bad information 
they look at it and because they're AI and they don't have common sense, they're like, well, look at all this new data that came out that said polar bears are vegetarians. Diplomats will try to do that. So what you want to do is keep to the facts by practicing and knowing the need won't spectrum. That's what you need to do. Um, any language from them in a contract, you review it. And guys, I know this sounds silly. You're like, hey, I got a deal. They got a contract. Y'all, I have seen a lot of contracts where people are like, hey, we agreed to this term. I've got an email that shows we agreed to this term. The contract does not say that term. So don't you sign it. Don't you agree to it. You go back and you will want to document with it. Like if you have a good negotiation with somebody and you're not signing a document that day, you go back and you put what you understood the terms to be in an email and send it back to them. Get that documentation out there. Because if you're dealing with a diplomat, they may send you a contract where they've said X, but the contract reads Y. And if you sign it, guess what? You're bound by it. Because that contract's going to say, hey, this is the only negotiation we have. Anything outside of this negotiation does not count. So that is our big worry in that situation is, I don't want you guys being locked into something by a diplomat because we didn't read it. Now, other aspects here, look at who you're talking to. You know, if they're analytical, if they look like an engineering type, if they look like the type who's really heavy on details, stick to them. Accuracy, minimize the risk, talk about time, concrete variables, respect that process, y'all. That works on a bureaucrat, it works on an engineer. I get it, you're in here in this system and you gotta make it work this way. How do we make this deal work within that system? Uh, Detail-oriented, be detail-oriented, do not fib, because if they catch you in a fib or if they catch you in like posing, they will use it against you. And that will stick in their mind. They'll be like, oh, wait a minute, you told me something I know is not true. Um, I catch people in that a lot. You know, I'll be interviewing somebody and they'll tell you A, they'll forget they told you A in a couple hours, they'll tell you B and you're like, hmm, interesting. And so what I want you to do is with the analytical types, minimize risk. Now, if they appear straight or uh, to the point or direct, I'm like, hey, what do you want? Guess what? Give them control, give them results, give them autonomy. You know, how do you make them feel that they are like, hey, now I'm in control, I'm making this happen. Let them choose. That's why I'm telling everybody here, have multiple options. You can have a delivery date, a cost, and a duration. Those can all vary. You can have six variations on those. So don't go in there with my way or the highway. Go in there kind of with the cafeteria plan. You know, I've got six ways we can work this out. Let's see which one works for us. To do that, though, you've got to think before you go in. You aid linking it. You sharpen that axe for four hours. You cut for two. Because if you start just whopping on the tree, you haven't thought about it. Now, is this a sycamore? Is it an oak? You know, which way do I cut? Which way is it going to fall? There are a lot of things you need to worry about before before you go in there, but with the directive types, make them feel like they made the decision. You give them a lot of choices they choose. To them, that's the win. They made the decision. Uh, social, spontaneous, creative types. If you're talking to them, affirmation. Love this. You know, it seems like you guys have a great team here. Y'all are doing awesome. I get excited about the energy here. Talk to them. You know, be human. You know, that's part of what you're doing is you're just trying to be able to say, hey, we'd like to make a deal. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Talancy came back and said, hey, delivery date, cost, and what? Um, oh, oh, great. Delivery date, cost, and duration of the contract. Delivery date, cost, maybe milestones. You know, we need to hit X by June, or X by July, or Y by September. There are a lot of different times, a lot of different ways you can work on that. You know, delivery date, cost, anything that you can vary. You know, timing is a great one. To be able to say, hey, you know, I can work with you on this. You work with me on price. There are a lot of different ways that you can use these with folks. Um, if you got an empathetic, good listener, you know, they're usually concerned about fairness. You know, they're leaning in and they're like, hey, you know, I want to make certain this is fair for both parties. And what you do is you assure them that, hey, that's why I'm here too. I just want us both to get a deal that we're happy with, that we can work with, and that we agree to these critical terms on. Um, if they bring up a concern, thank them for it. You know, it's like, hey, I get it. You know, that's a really good point. Let's talk about that. Um, they want you to listen. You know, as Hemingway said, if you're not listening, you're not learning. When you're dealing with the emphatic types, the good listeners, the ones who are like concerned about fairness, listen. They're going to tell you a lot, but you got to listen. With these guys, appeal to fairness. It's a good way to be able to say, hey, you know, fair to both sides. You know, this time's good for me. This price is good for you. Fair. You get something, I get something. Um, be nice to subordinates. If they do bring in underlings, you want to talk to everybody in the room and treat them all great because trust me, there are folks who don't do that. It's noticed and it will impact your negotiations. You be nice to everybody in that room. All right. Nobody's totally one style. 
you're going to have variations on this. Everybody's kind of like one of those little Venn diagrams where they all overlap a lot or a little. Uh, you want to figure out which one you're working with. And you're the same way. Your style may vary from time to time. Uh, your style may vary from negotiation to negotiation. It may vary depending on what you're trying to negotiate. It's okay. Um, I do want y'all to be uh, firm and courteous. You know, I don't want wishy-washy. I don't want scared. And that's okay. And I know this is kind of nerve-wracking. Heck, you're negotiating for your business, but you're going to practice. And you're going to take that emotion out of it. Remember, you're Dr. Spock. You are not a freaking honey badger. Or I guess it's Mr. Spock. Dr. Spock, I think, is an obstetrician. Anywho, never mind. It's been a Thursday. But we're all Mr. Spock. And what I want y'all to do is to realize, hey, you know, we take the emotion out of this. We keep it into a work-based conversation. Then what we've got is the ability to say, hey, I have made it easier on me, believe it or not. I have now practiced this. I have now taken some of this emotional content and turned it into a way to think about this from a different angle. So I do want y'all to not do these ad hoc. Just don't rush into that negotiation. I want y'all to be like, hey, here I am, and I'm here to talk. Now, of course, don't go in and be full, Mr. Spot. I am a robot. These are my terms. This is what I must discuss. That doesn't happen, guys. Just like we talked about a battle plan, as soon as that negotiation starts, there's going to be some variation to what you thought things would uh, go. They'll go a different way. Be nimble. You know, again, be human. Ask them how they're doing. Engage them. You know, this isn't some sort of gladiatorial combat. We're here to talk to them about a deal and hopefully keep working with them for a while. Um, also, guess what? You can offer them stuff. It's like, hey, I know everybody here is wanting you to have a two-week time around. I'm good with the six-week time around. You know, what can we do on price? What can we do on that? You know, you've got a lot of terms you can negotiate. And if you will show the other side that you're willing to do that, they, in turn, will be willing to do it with you. Now, what should you negotiate? Now, Talanta, you asked this one, but right here is a lot of the issues we can talk about. Pricing, discounts. You know, if I buy X, can I get a discount? If I pay by Y, can I get a discount? If I pay in cash, can I get a discount? Additional costs. Hey, I'm paying this. What's in the future? What's going to happen? Shipping costs included. You know, is there some sort of handling fee? What if I don't need it? You want to charge me a restock fee? You know, figure out what all's in there. You want that in your writing. You do not want surprises. I mean, when I engage somebody, I send out an engagement letter. Nobody ever reads it. Nobody ever reads it. They sign it. They send it back. But I will have our pricing there. And I'll tell you what's coming up in the future. And I'll tell you how much it costs. Because what I don't want are surprises, guys. You know, y'all don't want that either. When you negotiate with somebody, get this in writing. You know, your term. How long is the deal going to last? You know, can it be shorter? Can it be longer? Are there milestones? You know, is maybe some of the product delivered in May and some is delivered in September and some in December? You know, you can work with them on this if it works for your business to do that. How are they going to support you? You know, what kind of support do you want? Uh, you know, we do this web, we do an email, we do a phone, kind of get on a Zoom, kind of chat like we're doing today. You know, is it available 24 hours? Is it 9 to 5 Eastern? Find these out because these are things you can use to negotiate the other elements. Um, you know, what's our response time? If I call you at noon and I need something desperately, how quick are you getting back? To you know, get that in your contract, get that written down. You know, do I have a dedicated, like, is Samantha my person? If I call and Samantha's my person and she's there, that's awesome. If she's not there, I know that Tom's my backup. You know, do I have dedicated staff? Now, your notice periods, you know, most contracts are going to say, hey, you know, if something goes wrong, you're going to have a certain period to cure it. You'll be in default, meaning something broke, or the other side will be in default, meaning something's not going the way it should go, but there'll be a cure period. You can negotiate that. You can say, hey, you know, you may have a 10-day cure period. I'll give you 10 you know, I'm willing to work a little bit with you here. I'm willing to show, hey, I'm very reasonable. So, Talanti, these are some of the things we negotiate. And this isn't a complete list. This is just some examples to get y'all thinking about. Now, negotiation and action. Those deadlines, use them. Uh, but make sure they work for you. Do not set some artificial payment deadline that you can't meet. If you're a vendor supplying to somebody, do not promise some delivery deadline that you know you can't make. You know, that's all that emotional garbage. That's the won't version, and we're not get, negotiating there. Make certain that you can make those dates because guess what? If you can't make those dates, you lose leverage. But if you can, you make leverage. And like old Kenny Rogers said, no, you can walk away. That helps you understand what your leverage points are. You know, what do I have to, what do I need from this? What do I have to get? You know, not what I want, what do I need? Remember, emotion's the want, logic's the need. What do I need? What makes my company better? What makes this deal okay for me? Anticipate the other side. Get that by practicing with somebody. Talk to somebody. Sort of give them an explanation of what you're doing, why you're having this negotiation. You will be shocked to shop. They'll come back with you. Um, again, alternatives, guys. Start with the need, emotionless. 
go to the want and emotion. You know, have that as your spectrum on your durations, your prices, etc. It's a good way to think of it. What what do I have to have to make this work? What would I really like to have to make this work? That can be your range. Um, face to face. I know we're not all face to face today, but if you do something with somebody and they're like, "Hey, we can Zoom," take it. Um, a lot of the younger generation do not like to call. They don't like direct communication. I think you can use that to your advantage. Uh, one little sneaky thing I do: um, if I deal with an attorney who does not turn on their Zoom. That really causes me to be like, hmm, you know, why are we not seeing each other? Why are we not communicating? And so it causes you to think. It causes you to evaluate. But if you can see somebody, do see them, do understand them. You're able to look at them. You're able to sense them. You're able to see how they are. I mean, you guys can tell that, hey, you know, I'm sitting there talking to you in a calm tone of voice. I use my hands to talk. Uh, you know, I'm trying to make eye contact with the screen so everybody can see me. That helps. If you don't have that screen, you don't know. You know, maybe they're back reading a newspaper, talking through it to you. So you want to see them so that you can get a good take on, hey, how are my terms being proposed? What's their response to my terms? Package items in a group. Guess what? You don't go in there, honey bad. This is the price. It must happen. This is the duration. It must happen. You go in there flexible. Hey, pricing for this time, pricing for this product, pricing for this volume, discounts, extensions. There are a lot of ways y'all can work this out. You know, just back to Sarah talking about going to the Cobra Center. She paid in cash and saved a lot of money. It's okay to do that. It's okay to say, hey, you know, I'm willing to have a payment turnaround of X. Can you give me a discount? You know, if I need longer terms, you know, do I add a little to the price? There are ways that you can flesh it out so it's good for y'all. Um, now, you want those elements related, you know, like pricing and duration. Those are related. You know, you don't want something that's totally unrelated, like pricing and I'm trying to think of something crazy. Um Pricing and, you know, when your Christmas party is coming, you know, hey, do I get invited to the Christmas party? Am I now part of the family? Can I come to the picnic? Keep it tied together. Keep those business units together. You know, units, discount, pricing, duration. Keep them together. If you start asking for weird things like, hey, you know, you know, do I get a steak dinner and you're going to take me out? That's going to denigrate from your negotiation. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to say, hey, I focused. I know what my terms are. An employment agreement. Y'all, this is a great one to show you things you can negotiate. And again, you know, Talancy, use this in your agreements. When you're looking at your vendor, think on it. Compensation, what's my price? What's my discount? Termination, how long is this going to last? What's going to end this thing? You know, same for a vendor agreement. You know, if you guys are uh, on the news and your vendor's out there doing crazy stuff, you can be like, hey, more clause. I'm out. You're nuts and I'm gone. That's okay. Um, you lengthen your employment. You know, hey, you know, don't want this unlimited. Don't want to work here six months. There are ways to have them. Your performance indicators. You know, how am I going to be judged on what I'm doing? What is it that makes me your good employee? What is it that you're going to be looking at to make certain that I'm working for you? My business expenses. You know, do I get my expenses? What am I paying for mileage? You know, am I getting health insurance? Do we have a retirement plan? Do I have paid leave? Do, you know, what's my work status? Am I full-time? Am I part-time? Am I hybrid? Am I at home? Am I a remote employee? I'm always in the office. So y'all remember, negotiation is just looking at terms and trying to figure them out. You have the best success when you have a lot of varied terms and you've got variations on those. Package deals. You know, package one, package two, package three, package four. Have those and be willing to switch between them. Have those and be willing to exchange parts out as long as it's good for you. Helps you to get what you need, not necessarily what you want. Um. More of it, you know, exclusive versus non-exclusive. If I'm a non-exclusive vendor and I'm good with that, cool, guess what? Uh, if you're dealing with somebody and you don't want them to go into a certain market, you're going to have to negotiate. You may have to pay more for it. Um, does this exclusiveness limit business growth? Like if you're a vendor and you're working with somebody and you're like, hey, we're going to use you in electronics and you can't help anybody else in electronics, you're going to want paid more for that. You're going to want a VIG on that. You're going to want a bonus on top of it. Uh, compensation royalties, you know, guess what? If we have a product and I'm selling it and you want a royalty on it, how do we negotiate that? What do we do with it? Um, if you're talking to somebody and maybe, you know, Michael's talking about doing research with what he comes up with, does he own it? Does USC own it? He's got to sit down and do that math and figure out, okay, how does this work? Um, you know, for a license or short terms are better. If you're giving somebody permission to use your stuff, maybe you've got a product you're leasing out to them, short terms are always better. The other side wants it for as long as they can go. You want it for as short as you can for as much money as you can get. So now you're starting to understand the dynamics. You know, it's like, hey, licensor, short time, a lot of money. Licensee, long time, little money. So y'all got to negotiate in between those two. Um, guess what? You can also say, hey, 
you know, even though you're working for me, if you don't hit a certain revenue, uh, guess what? We're going to have to get out of here. Or early termination can occur for, you know, moral calls violations or whatever it is. But you need to make certain that you've got these in writing. And this is something you can uh, negotiate, guys. All of this can absolutely be talked about. Um, you know, your warranties. You know, what kind of warranties you get from these folks? Are you willing to take a change in those? Discuss that with counsel. You know, don't go in there and just wave your warranties hoping for the best. You know, talk about it. You know, your IP and non-infringement warranties. If you're selling somebody, hey, I've got a product. And um, they're like, hey, I need assurances that I'm not going to be sued for it. Uh, watch for your indemnification clauses. You know, a lot of times you'll see people send you over an agreement. It's like, all right, anything at all happens, you're indemnifying me and you're paying court costs. I want y'all to be very careful just signing something. There. It's all negotiable. Uh, we have a question, Michael, again. How are non-disclosure agreements negotiated? And is there a basic form or format you recommend for a non-disclosure? Um, non-disclosures are really can be quite simple, Michael, or extremely complex. Um, and again, this is kind of what we're talking today. What terms do you want out of it? You know, one form of a non-disclosure is I'm going to tell you vendor stuff you can't ever tell anybody. Boom. That's a pretty simple one. You want it in writing. You're going to explain what you're going to tell them. And you're explaining that you can't do a thing with it. And if our relationship ends, here's what happens to all the stuff I gave you. That is one way to do it. You may have a situation to where you're like, hey, you can disclose to certain people or for certain times. So there are a lot of ways that you can use it. Now, a good old typical non-disclosure agreement is, hey, I'm going to tell you things and you're never going to tell anybody else. That's a pretty straightforward one to have. But you can negotiate those terms. That's a really good question, Mike. Because I want you and y'all are thinking the right way. You're like, hey, non-disclosure agreement. That's a contract. I can negotiate it. You can. But you got to be careful because if you're going there saying, ah, you're going to tell me stuff and I don't want to non-disclose it to anybody, you may upset the other side. So be careful. Certain things are negotiable. Certain things are a warning sign. So if they come to you with a uh, document and you're like, ah, I don't want to sign a non-disclosure agreement, that can freak them out a little bit. So understand that there is a certain reality here. We don't want to disrupt by appearing to be like, oh, no, you know, if you're going to tell me stuff, I'll tell everybody. Not at all. But if they come in and say, hey, you know, it's going to be limited for this. And you got to destroy things within an hour of us quitting. You can negotiate on that. Y'all, negotiation follow up. You know, one thing I said I want us to learn today is it's not done when you get up from the table. It's done when we have ink signed documents. That's when it's done. Handshakes, I don't care how nice they were. I don't care how great that meeting went. If y'all got one this afternoon and you walk out of it thinking, I knocked it out, it's great. I had a handshake. That's the beginning of getting it in final form. That's the beginning of getting it in final form. Uh, you want that writing to confirm what you understand. Remember, the diplomat's going to sort of polish you up, tell, shine you on, tell you, hey, you know, it can be X, but it might be Y. You need to make certain that you see it. And guess what? If something happens to these terms and you're like, hey, you know, I was thinking about this. We may need to revise this. It's okay. You can go back to them, make them aware of it. Don't try to sneak it in. You can just send them an email saying, hey, you know, I looked at this. What if we change the delivery date to that? You know, you might reopen the negotiation with them a little bit, but it's also something that can be done. Now, I will tell you this last one. It reads like Dr. Seuss, but go through it slow. If it's not in there, it's not in there. Put it in there. If they promise that you would have some sort of um, right to vacate, and it's not in there, it's not in there. You don't have that right. If they promised that you were going to get a discount for a volume over X, and it's not in there, it's not in there. Put it in there. You know, don't be afraid to add to this document things that you agreed to. Because, guys, at the end of the day, you're going to see what is basically called the sum up calls. And it says, hey, everything we talked about is incorporated by this document. Anything else doesn't exist, never happened. It's just in this document. So y'all, you make certain it's in there. You make certain that writing is your work agreement. Take notes. It's okay to be writing during a negotiation. It's not sort of television commercial where you're always on your toes. Take notes, write things down. If you get out, if you leave the negotiation, go back to your car, kind of sit down and think, okay, now here's the way I remember the terms. We'll point them out. Make certain you've got them down there specifically. Follow back up with an email form. You know, say, hey, when are we going to get this contract done? It is a good way to make certain that everything stays on pace. Now, bad tactics. I don't want a honey badger. Everything's not a deal breaker. You know, most things are negotiable. If you think everything's a deal breaker, you're not going to be very good at negotiating. Don't bluff. Do not lie. Do not fib. If they catch you in it, it really harms your credibility. It will probably cause them to offer very harsh terms. Might even cause them just to walk away. Not listening, they may be telling you exactly what you want to hear, but you're so focused on getting them what you want them to hear that you're not listening. 
that you're not hearing that maybe they're helping. Negotiating against yourself. Glancy, this is us, baby. This is us. We have that tendency to want to talk. You've got that tendency to be like, here's my number. This is my flat number. I'm real honest. You can trust me. No. What I need y'all to do is this. Now, I'm shocked nobody asked if the video froze. But what I wanted y'all to do was silence. If there are points when you're in a negotiation and you've made a statement or you've thrown out a term, sit on it. Go silent. Just hang. Let it go out there. You do not need to fill that dead space. What you want is a response for them. Because otherwise, if you say 10, and all of a sudden they don't agree to 10 immediately, they're like, hey, well, they're like, all right, now I know what the fake numbers are. So we don't want that. We want you guys to be okay with a silence. It is okay. You know, you do not have to bid against yourself. If you come out with a number, say, hey, what about X? Don't under bid. Just stop, politely look at them, and wait for a response, y'all. It's okay. And I don't care if they sit there and are haggling on it, thinking on it. You let them chew. If they don't give you a response, it's like, well, you know, that was my offer. What did you think on that? Get them to re-engage. Pull them back into the discussion. But also remember, guys, we just don't have one thing in mind. Have a plan. Have lots of options that you can hopefully get one to work with or change some of the parts up on those options to get an option you both agreed to. Be nimble. And remember, you guys are a small business. You're not BMW. You don't have all these contract guidelines and things that you must go through and must happen every time. You're a small business. You've got the ability to negotiate. You've got the ability to handle it because guess what? You're the CEO and the janitor. You're the CEO and the copy guy. You're the CEO and the account. That's you. You've got all this freedom. It is an awesome thing. Now, guys, I saw we had a question pop up in the chat. Uh, Costas, so many times people will say they'll add things to agreements and never live up to it because it wasn't erotic. Costas, you're dead on, buddy. You're dead on, guys. Remember that Dr. Seuss language? If it ain't in there, put it in there. Because if it's supposed to be in there and it's not in there, it's not in there. It doesn't count. Because the problem I don't want y'all to face is, but man, we have these great terms. I got this contract back and I don't know what to do. Sure you do. You go back to them and you say, hey, this isn't what we agreed to. Here are my notes from that day. Here's what we did. And if you find out that they're trying to change the deal on you, maybe this is somebody you don't want to negotiate with. So y'all, we're right at an hour. I want to respect y'all's time, but I'm here for any questions that y'all have. Feel free to ask me anything you got. I'm sitting here looking at the chat. Feel free to unmic and talk to me. I am right here. Again, my name is Doug Lineberry. I'm a uh, patent attorney, IP attorney, trademark attorney. I'm at Burt Foreman right downtown, um, right here in Greenville, right across from Carolina Owl House. And here is my email. If I'll stop hitting return, you'll get all this stuff in one thing instead of 15. And this is my direct line. If y'all ever have a, a question, call me. I'm happy to talk. You just say, hey, I was in Costas's event. I was there with Emily. I was there with Sarah. And it's like, I would like to talk to you about this. That is awesome. And so what I would want y'all to do is to be able to say, hey, um, oh, awesome. Michael's got a great question. He says, hey, how do I initiate contact with these great big organizations? Well, here's the trick. What you want to do is to say, and for some reason, I'm just emailing Costas directly. I don't quite know why I'm doing that. But um, Michael, the thing to do is they're going to have a way for you to access them. Uh, you'll want to call somebody. They'll probably have a general contact number. And you're going to say, hey, I'm interested in working with you guys. What do I do? They will have a submission process. Like us for summer interns, uh, we have a submission process. We have a process to where they apply, to where, hey, you go out to everybody and you talk to them about it. Thank you, Costas. Um, some reason, guys, it's just referring to Costas whenever I type. But with these or large organizations, Michael, remember, respect the infrastructure. You know, go through it with them. Show them that, hey, I'm Michael Bailey. I'm playing by the rules. I'm trying to help you out here and do your thing. That's a good question. Y'all feel free. Matthew, Burned, Leslie, Rebecca, Craig, anybody. Ask a question. Ricky, Russell, Karen, whatever you'd like to know. Let me know right now. I'm right here to help. All right. So I got a question. Okay. Uh, this is Ricky Covington. Uh, so let's say if I have a, a, a group of us, like a mastermind that we have, we put this corporation together, we put this business together. Should yep. we go in as a group for negotiations or should I just get the information that we all want and then go in and negotiate on behalf of the company myself for a particular um, um, agreement. Ricky, I love that. That is an awesome question. And I'll tell you this, it's going to, and of course, as an attorney saying it depends. Tell me about the personalities in that group, because if you're going to bring in a hothead, if you're going to, if it's going to be Mr. Calm Ricky and three honey badgers, I'm saying you send in Mr. Calm Ricky. 
Now, if it's going to be right. Mr. Calm Ricky and Mr. Calm Rusty and Mr. Calm Burned, that can work. Now, you are going to have to uh, figure out going in, you know, who's going to be the centerpiece, who's going to be the person who talks, because we don't want a lot of crosstalk, and you guys will definitely have to practice together. Um, and it's a good show of force to show, hey, you know, i got multiple people, but, you know, it's like anywhere in the planet. You know there's some people who are good with other people. You know there are people who are not good with other people. You don't want to involve them. You know, they might be the best uh, software programmer you've got or the best at building something, but guess what? You need to freaking make uh, certain that whoever's in that room can negotiate. Because if you bring in a honey badger, understand that honey badger is going to be there balanced the whole time, full of adrenaline and ready to attack. And what you want to do is save the honey badger. Have them do the activities that honey badger keyed up for. Production, coding, whatever it may be. But Ricky, that's an awesome question because it shows you need to understand who your partners. Who's going to yes, be sir. the face person? Who's going to be the person who talks? Y'all to agree, y'all agree to that beforehand. And you have to have an honest discussion. And it's like, you know, you look at Samantha and you're like, Samantha, you're a honey badger. I turn you loose in there, this thing may go south. But you're the best coder I've ever had. You're awesome. Um, uh, let me hit Michael first. Okay, we got a couple popping up here. Um uh, thank Michael, you. Yeah, you're welcome, Ricky. Good question. Michael says, What if you can't get to the decision maker? There's an intermediary who doesn't know what they're doing. You know, Michael, that is part of the problem, my friend. And you're going to have to be persistent and kind because you know what? You don't want to ever tell the intermediary they don't know what they're doing. If you do that, um, you're A, doing a couple of things we said not to do. You're violating the infrastructure and you're kind of being a honey badger, man. You're sitting there and you're hitting on that person's like, ah. You know, what you can do though is say, hey, is there any way we can involve uh, others in here? You know, I'd like to do a presentation. I'd like to talk to you all about it, et cetera. Now, Costa says, what if one of those partners tends to talk too much? Don't bring them. Don't bring them. We want a negotiator, not a bullhorn. If you've got a partner who's just going to be foghorn, leghorn, boy, bam, bam, bam. No, don't do that. Uh, bring in the folks who are going to be the Ricky Covington who are going to be able to talk and get a good, coherent message out and be nimble. You know, because, again, if this person talks too much, they're not listening. And they're probably preventing you from listening. Uh does the SBDC, this is Michael Bailey's question, does the SBDC have support for negotiating contracts without having to bring in a law firm? I'm going to leave you for dear Costas on that one. I think the answer is yes. Uh, Leslie Wallace, I'm a new business and tend to get into the room with movers and shakers. We offer warehouse space and union to local and surrounding businesses. How can we make that happen? I'm a new business and tend to get into the room with movers and shakers. Need. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. So great. Just like Michael asked, Leslie, what you've got to do is you're going to have to go through the infrastructure with these folks. And you may have to figure out where do they hang out. You know, are they a member of a civic organization? Are they a member of the chamber? You know, do they do SBDC events. You may want to go and find them. You know, you're going to have to A, use the infrastructure out, like I told Michael, because you've got to go through their chain of command. If you try to jump it, that person is like, nope, nope, you got to talk to Sheila. You don't get to me until you talk to Sheila. So talk to Sheila. But if you understand where that person's at or their ways to get a hold of them in a different way, feel free to circumvent the system because guess what? When they leave it to go outside, it's okay for you to circumvent that system by going outside to someplace too. And so you've really got to kind of put yourself in that position. You got to learn who they are, learn who you want to get in front of. And again, y'all, a phone call solves a, modern, a lot of modern problems. Say, hey, you know, Leslie, when you're in front of y'all, you know, I've got a warehouse space. You guys need warehouse space, X, Y, Z. You know, if you can figure out what they're paying the other folks, you've got a great end to be like, hey, I can give you a good deal. So there are a lot of ways that you can do that, Leslie. But all of that is you have to negotiate your way in. That's all we've talked about today is how to negotiate. It works for getting your toe in the door. But, you know, like I told Michael, though, you got to respect that system. You might be talking with somebody and you're like, you just don't get it. But you can't tell them that because if you do, it's going to sour the well. Costas has reappeared. Michael, to, to your question about the SBDC uh, support for negotiating contracts, we can help you with the preparation and do trial runs through it and stuff like that, but we cannot actually be involved in the, those negotiations. If you have any any contracts that you want reviewed, we can look over it. We can, we can give you advice, but again, this is just advice and when it comes to the actual legal terminology within those contracts, I would defer it to the attorney anytime because it can look good to me, but Doug or some other attorney might pick up on something that, you know what, to an individual, this looks good. It's going to keep them from trying to do something, but for someone who's litigious or really just doesn't care, they'll go to their attorney and uh, we can just tear this apart in, in court. And I'll tell you one thing, Costas, that's an awesome point. Thank you for making that. 
Because one thing, Michael, is you're going to see a lot of folks who are like, hey, I'm going to go get me a document off the internet. I found a great contract that says what I want it to say. This is beautiful. Don't need an attorney. I don't need a cost. I don't need anybody. I got this thing. What I want you to be very wary of is, again, we're all Americans. We're all proud Americans. And the thing is, you know, what we've done here is we live in a nation of 50 states. And we also live in a nation of 12 judicial districts. And a contract that can be used in Area A might not work in Area B. So I want y'all to be very loath about saying, hey, I am going to go and pull something out of thin air and make it work for me. Because if you do that, there is a real chance that it might not work at all. And I don't want you guys getting into that trouble. You know, legal Zoom and places like that, y'all, I realize you see those prices and you're like, this is great. I'm going to get a contract. It's going to be awesome. I'll tell you this, it might be awful. And indeed, it might be horrible. And indeed, it might be the worst thing you've ever done because a lot of these are very generic contracts. You know, in South Carolina, we're very open about non-competes. We're very open about the time and the uh, geographic span. You try that same thing in the Ninth Circuit where California's at and Washington's at, Montana's at, it's not going to fly. Void ab initio. There are a lot of things like that. You know, right to work state versus uh, uh, work to hire. You've got a lot of differences, y'all. So do not go pull a document off the internet thinking it's going to get it. If you are going to enter into a contract with somebody and you're unsure what a term is, or you're unsure what the implications of it will be, hire you an attorney in that area. You know, like, Michael, if you're in South Carolina and you're entering into a contract that's going to be enforced in New York, you're going to want to have a New York attorney look at it. And I realize that's a pain in the butt, but if you don't do that and you try to use a California document in New York, you're going to have some bad problems. Guys, we have some more chats pop up. Um, bear with me one second. I'm glad y'all like this, guys. I love doing this. Uh, y'all are awesome. Those are great questions. And uh, Talansi, I got to tell you, that's the bravest thing I've heard somebody ask in a long time. That is awesome. Just to be able to say, hey, you know, I realize what one of my issues is. That's how you win the negotiation. You start off by knowing, hey, I need to fix this. And again, remember that need won't spectrum. Needs the logic, wants the emotion. You can use that to figure out your ranges on your times, on your prices, whatever it might be. Y'all have been wonderful. Costas, Emily, Sarah, thank y'all for having me. Doug, thank, thank you, you so much for being here. Absolutely, gang. If anybody ever needs me, cost us through the info out there. Again, my name is Doug Lineberry. I work for Burr Foreman in Greenville. Everybody have a great week. I'd like to thank everybody for attending the workshop. And I have my information up on the screen if you need to reach out to me. Mm -hmm.